Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, the School of Ministry in the Word and the Spirit. We're talking about knowing the Holy Spirit. In this series, we've been looking at the teaching of the Old Testament and the teaching of the New Testament concerning the Holy Spirit. And every day, we discover that the Holy Spirit is God's way of touching our lives, God's way of reaching to us and protecting us and drawing us closer to Himself. But the New Testament, in particular, leads us to the understanding that the Holy Spirit is not just God's influence or God's power, but it is about a person, the third person of the Trinity, God of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when we talk about knowing the Spirit, we're talking about the person and experiencing Him in our lives. Now, as soon as we open up to the Holy Spirit, we find the wonderful thing we get to know Jesus better. We get to understand God's word better. And we also receive his power to do the things that God has called us to do. In this session, we're going to be talking about power for warfare. In other words, how we can stand strong spiritually in the spiritual battle that is in our lives. We know about how to move in power to proclaim the name of Jesus, but for that, power for signs and miracles. Now, let's look at the power to stand strong and wage a good warfare spiritually in the name of Jesus. The passages like 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 to 6, speak about the weapons that we have and the power that we have in order to deal with the devil. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for putting down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. In there, the context is of, of spiritual warfare in the context of church discipline and showing that in church life, the enemy comes up and brings arrogance uh, into the lives of people and leaders get arrogant and they need to be disciplined and they need to deal with these things on a spiritual level. Speaking about that, Paul says, don't worry, you've got the weapons to do it, I will help you do it. Now, the Spirit does not just give us power to speak publicly for Jesus, but also power to live purely for Jesus, and the power to say no to the temptations of the devil. This is part of our spiritual warfare. There is within us the desire for other things. The world, the flesh, and the devil seem still to be offering something attractive to us. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't so easily give in to sin. But the Bible says that as believers, we have the Holy Spirit who will strengthen us against vices such as uh, 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 ambition, reputation, uh, love of reputation, love of adulation, or uh, vices such as addictions, whether it's addictions to smoking or drinking or, or other things. The Holy Spirit gives us strength to be patient with people uh, when people try our patience, to keep our tempers, to stand firm under pressure, to love the unlovable, in fact, to do all the godly things that the enemy is constantly trying to ensure that we don't do. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that we should see every conflict as some kind of demonic activity. Some people are over-concerned to wrestle with Satan. Even when you say grace, they're binding with demons and mashed potatoes or something, rather than just giving God glory for all things. Yet, we still must recognize that we as believers are part and parcel of aspects of, of fallen humanity, and aspects of that fallenness still remain part of us, and will do so until sin is completely eradicated out of our lives when we glorify in heaven. But the ordinary problems of life can seem so overwhelming, the ordinary temptations that come our way, that we must remember God gives us grace and power to overcome our weaknesses. He gives us power to stand strong in faith, to be strengthened, to speak and act in the right way, to make us equal to the pressures that we face. And we can be sure that with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can stand strong and we can receive the victory and we can live a victorious Christian life. That's why Paul prays for Dunamis, for his readers in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. He says, I pray that he would grant according to the riches of his glory, that you be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So God 
wants us to receive that power, the power of the Holy Spirit, that we might live victorious lives and be victorious against all the strategies of the devil. So we see that God gives us power for public proclamation, power for miracles, power for spiritual warfare, and now power for hope and perseverance in the things of God. Hope, you see, in New Testament language, is not as we use it in our English language. Hope, so I hope the bus will come. Well, it doesn't. Hope that it won't rain today. Well, it does rain. No, it's not that kind of hope. Hope in the Bible is hope, so something we'd like to happen, but you're not very sure whether it's going to happen or not. That's not Bible hope. We have a hope far better than that. Our hope is Jesus Christ. Our hope is the resurrection. Our hope has entered within the veil. His name is Jesus. There is a certainty here. The hope of our salvation is the certain, confident expectation that Jesus Christ is going to return. He is our blessed hope. So now we need to know that hope for all of God's promises. I already mentioned Romans chapter 15 and verse 13, where it says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can abound in hope. Now, the difficulty is this. We, in our worldly thinking, which still affects believers, are so influenced by the world's quick solutions to problems and difficulties that we are easily, we easily take those options rather than waiting on the Holy Spirit to receive God's power to persevere through the hardships that come. Now the Apostle Paul needed to know hope and perseverance. You see, your perseverance is fed by hope. You understand? You can endure anything you know it's coming to an end. You can even endure this course if you know it's coming to an end. And so if you know that your trials and tests and temptations are going to come to an end and God's going to make you victorious, you can endure them. You know that there's a purpose in them. And so this hope that's within you gives you endurance. And if we read 2 Corinthians 6, verses 3 to 10, let's just do that. It's a long passage, but we'll see the need for hope. The Apostle Paul says, We give no offense in anything, but our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things we commend ourselves as mercies for God in much patience. See, if you're really going to live the anointed life that the Apostle Paul lived, if you're really going to minister for Jesus Christ, if you're really going to embrace everything that the Holy Spirit is and wants you to re receive, you're going to need this kind of patience. And here's why. Look what he went through. In much patience, in tribulation, in needs, in distresses, in stripes. Now these stripes are the stripes of honor, of marks, of office, or, or, or the rank of authority in the army. These stripes are stripes where, because you've been beaten. And perhaps they are, after all, stripes and marks of honor and rank. The more stripes you receive of persecution and opposition, the more you can graduate in the army of God's people. Amen? Stripes. In imprisonments, when it saved on hotel rooms, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings. Now here, the suggestion is not that this is the voluntary going without food in order to be spiritual, simply because there was nothing to eat. And you say, well, I thought the Apostle Paul was a mighty man of God, and I thought he was a mighty man of faith, and he, he didn't know what it was to lack. No, Philippians tells us that he knew what it was both to lack and to have an abundance. You know that in all your faith and prosperity teaching, don't forget this thing. There is a way, a path, a narrow path that God causes people to tread where you are far away from the comforts of High Lady in Sheraton or any of the other hotels and all the sumptuous fare, the food that is supplied there. There are times in God's work that you will go without because you've chosen to, to accept the rigors apostolic ministry where they're far from the comforts of modern life and the convenience of modern life. Most of the people in the world today who are unevangelized are, are nowhere in reach of a holiday in hotel. Hello? That's why they're not being reached. Think about it. By purity, by knowledge, 
by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceived as yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and yet behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Can you see that? The paradox that in all of this persecution and opposition and all of this pressure and difficulty, he says, I know how to rejoice because the power of God is working in me. So he knows the truth that God gives patience to endure troubles and difficulties. And we need to remember that God's power is feeding you for endurance. And it's often the way God will overcome hardships. Sometimes he'll just dismiss the hardships. He'll say, I don't want you to go through with that. It's cancelled. You're free. Other times he says, I want you to know my power in your hardships. That's the only way the world was won. I don't know if you ever read that book, How the West Was Won. I'm talking about the Wild West. How the West was won. Well, it was won not by nappy, cappy, lip wristed believers who are tough, far too soft. No, no, it was won by tough people who said, Right, we are going to do this. We are pioneers. They went and blazed a trail. Now that's how the people of this world are going to be won for Jesus Christ. We need people who will accept the rigors of evangelistic ministry and to go where Christ has not been preached and to demonstrate their endurance and say, I will put up with hardships. And we know when we take people on missions, we tell them this before they go. But when we get there, hardly 24 hours, the sun goes by before people start to complain. We didn't expect to be like this. The flies in my suit. Thank God for suit. Take the fly out of your suit and claim Mark 16, brother. Hallelujah. I remember, I can't get into stories. I can't get into stories. I remember one place where we went in Kenya. And it was right out into the, into the sugar cane area. And it was a very dangerous place to be uh, because there were a lot of illegal things taking place in that area. And any stranger that would come, and they would think they were out with the police. And a white man walks there and goes, what are you doing here? And you must be up to no good. And you must be, you know, trying to come and check out on us in some way. Anyway, I went with a group of these people, and we were preaching the gospel there. And we were going around telling people that we were holding a meeting and we stopped at one of these places. It wasn't a shop. It was the closest thing to a shop, a place where you could buy things. But that's as close to the shop as it was. And uh, the, the food that was there was some, was some dry meat, some cooked meat. And it was just open to all the flies and just open there like that. And the man said, oh, would you, would you have some? Well, I knew that if I did not accept that, that I would be causing considerable offense. And uh, it would certainly not have the cause of Christ. And... Um, wouldn't help me either. And so it was desperately unhygienic. I said to the rest of the team, you stand back, I'll take this. I claimed, Mark 16, you should eat. It would be any deadly thing. Sound hardly. And I ate it and I enjoyed it. Dead but glory. It had no effects at all. Glory to God. Now you may think differently watching today, I don't know, but I don't believe it. It affected me badly in any way at all. Now the Holy Spirit is the encourager. He is the one who will encourage you to keep on going. There's a saying, when the going get tough, gets tough, the tough get going. But when the going gets tougher still, the tougher still keep going. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will teach you to think in a way that sees the end result of your sufferings and not duck out of them because you can't stand up underneath them. So we come now to power for the church. The Holy Spirit gives power for the church. This is an important point because many people, when they think about power, say, Lord, empower me. Give it to me rather than empower us. God gives power in the context of the church. You understand this? God empowers the body of Christ. Now recently, especially in the West, there is a tremendous emphasis on individual, Western individualism. That's what we call it. And it's affected the church. And many church leaders have this attitude. They are, think of themselves as individuals. 
individual leaders under individual churches. And this individualism tears the body of Christ apart. And there is a constant need for believers to put, for leaders to put down their independence and join together with other believers in the body of Christ for the work of Jesus. It's also there at membership level. We need corporate responses, corporate relationships, corporate activities, and the Holy Spirit comes to anoint these as well. Now, one of the reasons why we have difficulty with this, because in English, unlike most other languages, uh, you can't tell whether you say you, as to whether you mean you as an individual, or you would if I said, will you stand up, please? You would assume that I meant all of you, because I'm teaching a class, and I'm addressing a class. But if I looked at somebody and said, would you stand up, you'd think, when I'm speaking to you individually. So I'd have to look at you in order to say such a way. I said, would you all stand up, please? And if, I, if I did that, you, you'd know by the way I'm signaling. Would you all stand up, please? Or would, would you stand up? I have to point to you. Would you stand up, please? So you have to do it other ways. But in other languages, uh, you can tell whether you are speaking to everybody or just to one person by using the plural form of you. I could say, would you stand up, please? And you would know that I meant all of you or one of you or some of you by use of that language. So very often, in fact almost always, the commandments uh, in, the, in the Bible are addressed to everybody, to you all. It's very rarely is it you as an individual. So it's to you all, meaning that God wants us to respond together with, to the promises of God and to obey together the commands of God. So God's power is given to operate within the church. And so we must understand we can't just simply say, I need an anointing, and you go off and do your own thing. No, you join together in the body of Christ with healthy relationships within the body, and you stand strong as a church. Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, and verse 18, I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Against what? Against the church against the church of Jesus Christ. So we see that the anointing and the power that God gives is for the church. So we should be saying far more often rather than give me, but give us this power. But the power for witness, which is my next point, is important. The power that God gives us is to witness for Jesus. We come to a verse like Acts chapter 4 and verse 33. And we see clearly, with great power, the apostles gave witness. And uh, they had the ability to persevere in signs and wonders to witness to Jesus. So every aspect of the Spirit's power is given to enable us to know Jesus better and to help us reveal Jesus more clearly to the needy world around us. The real test of spiritual power is whether or not it brings people into a deep knowledge and understanding of Jesus Christ. That's the real test. It's not just that the power is there to perform signs and wonders. It's there to witness to Jesus. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus makes it very clear that many people will say, we've done mighty works in your name. And he will say, I never knew you. So it's clear as possible to have the power to cast out demons, the power to prophesy, the power to perform miracles, and yet still not give an adequate witness to Jesus Christ. That witness for Jesus Christ comes out of your knowledge of him and how much you have allowed him to know you. It's talking about your relationship with him. And so relationship is more important even than the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Signs and wonders and miracles aren't given up in and of themselves are not enough to give a true witness to Jesus Christ. And the great example of this, it seems to me, is Simon Magus. In Acts chapter 8. Now you need to turn to Acts chapter 8. I want to spend a moment uh, there with you because it's so important that you get this point. Now you remember I was saying earlier that you cannot use power as a paradigm for everything about the Holy Spirit. Because when you make power your focus for the work of the Holy Spirit, you can be led into an error. And I want you to understand this very, very carefully because it's a, it's a very important point. Remember I said earlier when I used the example of electricity as a power example, 
about that with the Holy Spirit back here. Quick, you say that's only a picture because the Holy Spirit is not electricity. He's not an it. He's not a, a power or a force or an influence. Now, why is that important? Because you see today, many people are treating the Holy Spirit like that, as a power to switch on and off. He is not a power to be manipulated. If you can manipulate spiritual power, then it's not the Holy Spirit. It's a demonic spirit that allows itself to be manipulated in order ultimately to manipulate you. But the Holy Spirit is not a manipulator, and neither can he be manipulated. We do not have a mechanistic, impersonal view of the Holy Spirit, some force, some power, some influence. This is the error of the New Age movement, to think of power, uh, of spiritual power as being some kind of force. Now, and it is very similar to occult thinking. Uh, Acts chapter 8 and verse 9, here we have Philip ministering with great power in Samaria, but it says that there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. Now, can you see the danger of stressing power? It becomes depersonalized power. It's a force that you use and manipulate for your own purposes, usually to make out that you are someone great. Does that remind you of some tendencies of some superstar, spirit, superstar personalities, some great evangelists? Be very careful. When you're anointed with power and you're able to stand up in front of a group of people and to lay hands on the sick and to see them recover, they, they'll start looking at you. And it's very, very difficult. Uh, and you have to be very, very careful. And one of the ways that you understand this is by understanding the Holy Spirit is not a force or a power to be used or manipulated to make you look great. He is a person to whom you must submit. He is God. And if the Holy Spirit isn't doing it, you can't do it. And you must make sure that all the honor and the glory goes to Jesus Christ. Now, verse 11, they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip and preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles who were in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Hear this? Give me that power. It sounds okay, doesn't it? But look at the context. He hasn't changed his thinking. He thinks the Holy Spirit is some other power, just like the spiritual powers that he was manipulating. Give, I, I'll give you money, so you give me power, so that I can lay hands on people, and anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. He just said, your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither power nor portion in this matter, for you, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. This is the Simon Magus spirit, is how you begin uh, to manipulate or try to manipulate the Holy Spirit so that you look great and that the focus is on the power rather than on the person of the Holy Spirit. And so I don't think it is right to take power as your fundamental paradigm for the work of the Holy Spirit. It may be, perhaps, that Pentecostal Christians have been guilty of this because we are so, uh, we stress so much the power of the Holy Spirit. But we do this in order that we may, might be empowered to witness to Christ, to see Jesus Christ glorified. So be very careful of power talk. And it's not wrong to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, but remember, it's the power of the person. It's the influences of the Holy Spirit as a person that touches your life, and it's there to bring glory to Jesus Christ. And so the temptation is this. When you divorce power from truth, when you divorce power from holiness, when you divorce power from purity, 
the desire for power takes off as an end in itself, and it becomes love as a means to an end in itself, and it is corrupted, and it can destroy you. And I believe that's possible for people to begin this way, moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, but to fall away from that power and to end up into some kind of occult activity. Let's be aware of this. Too many people, believers pray for power for reasons other than knowing Jesus better and revealing him more clearly. It's sad to say too many leaders manipulate or try to manipulate divine power to their own will when they should be experiencing the Spirit's power so that they may obey God's will. You don't use the Holy Spirit. You submit to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit uses you. So we should not talk about the Spirit's work in human sense and language as if God's power, which is made available for us, is to be switched on and off for our use. Instead, we should make ourselves totally available to the Holy Spirit, who will bring God's power and God's demands into our lives so that we would be Christ centered and witness to Jesus Christ and bring glory to Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit in coming into your life, in bringing power into your life, so that you'll be more like Jesus. You might be enabled by the Holy Spirit to live like Jesus and witness like Jesus and perform mighty signs and wonders like Jesus. The dynamis is there for you to be like Jesus Christ. God bless you. That's the end of this session. We'll be back for the next session where we'll talk about the purity that the Holy Spirit comes to bring to your life. God bless you. And that brings today's teaching to an end. And I pray that God has blessed you and he will continue to bless you as you go through this series on knowing the Holy Spirit. And I pray that God will bring you closer and closer to this wonderful third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. So till next time, goodbye and God bless you.